Old Time Gospel Hour, program number 576, regular version. Today, from the campus of Liberty Baptist College in Lynchburg, Virginia, the faith partners and friends of the Old Time Gospel Hour bring you this special presentation. Thank you, you may be seated. And hello to all of you. How many freshmen here? Say amen. amen. Second year students, amen. amen. Third year students, amen. amen. Intelligent seniors, oh me. Amen. All right. Liberty Baptist College and Schools. Young people, today we're televising a special program for a special group of people called members of the 15,000 Club, a scholarship club of people all over several nations who by membership in that club and a $200 contribution have made your education possible this year. And I want us all at the count of three to say a big thank you to thousands of friends out there who are looking in right now on this special chapel service on Liberty Mountain who have contributed $200 towards your education, I want you right now at the count of three, not to say thank you, let's say God bless you. I mean really the Baptist way. Ready? One, two, three. God bless you. And with that, we say thank you to the persons who are making the education of these young people possible. This year, tuition is $2,000 here at Liberty. This is the fastest growing college in America, as far as we know, 12.6% growth this year. And this year, in our beginning our 13th year, it's the most exciting student body we've ever had. We appreciate the fact that you've joined the 15,000 Club. We charge about one-third of what most private colleges in America charge. If we charged $6,000 tuition, most of these young people would not be here. Is that about right, kids? And because of your contribution, they are here. We accept no government funds. By the way, if you want to know how much we've grown this year, I came over here for the first evening service when Dr. Dobson was preaching. Last year, we filled up all of this area, but we always had a big curtain down that completely covered that section of seats. No one was seated there. And that particular night, I, I, I did something to show everybody what our growth was over the previous year, I said, that section is our growth, and we rolled the big curtain up to the ceiling, and there it was as it is right now, Phil. Just to uh, graphically show our folks at home how much we have grown, would all of you in that section, all the way to the ceiling, stand right now. Come on, you ham, stand, please, and wave at the cameras. That's our growth for 1983-84. All right. And today, before this one-hour program is history, I'm praying, I'm hoping that all of our friends watching at home by television will dial a toll-free number. If you haven't joined 15,000 Club already, pledge your $200, which you may give at $20 a month or for 10 months or however you wish to do it. But many of these students are not yet underwritten. Our needs are not yet met. Obviously, we're sending nobody home. We're just trusting God to speak to you, to call that toll-free number today. And if you've never done it before, help a student through college today. Call, make your pledge, join the team. The Sounds of Liberty are students of Liberty Baptist College who travel with this preacher all over the country. And they're singing a song that is the foundation of what this program is about today as I'm speaking on how you can change the world. How firm a foundation. Jesus have fled. 
French are the pretty, the French are the pretty, the French are the pretty. I only design their dress to consume, and they go to recline. Sounds of Liberty. Our number one asset. Every th time we go on television talking about 15,000 Club, people who write and who support say the thing that impressed me most was meeting the young people. And right now we're going to have them share a word with you. Caleb Davenport is from Cincinnati, Ohio. He's a pastoral major, he's a senior, and Caleb. Tell us how you heard about Liberty Baptist College. I heard about Liberty Baptist College, Dr. Fall, on the old time gospel hour. And I really just wanted to come to Liberty to play college football. As I was here, God gained a break and changed my life through the preaching of the Word of God, my own personal devotions. My sophomore year, Chuck Milhoff preached a sermon on God can do it better. Mm -hmm. It was that point in time in my life I said, God, I want you to take my life and do whatever you want to do with it. And through the through that time, God has changed my life so much and the peace in my heart knowing that there is a reason and a real purpose to live in life. Caleb, when you graduate, what do you hope to do? I plan on going to Seattle, Washington and uh, being the evangelist from the church there with Daniel Henderson. God bless you, buddy. All right. Caleb Davenport, give him a hand. My gracious, these are champions for Christ. Rhonda Feltz is, let's see, you're a senior from Monroe, Louisiana, way down south. And you're majoring in what, Rhonda? Educational Ministries and Counseling. Educational Ministry and Counseling. How did you become a Christian? Uh, when I was nine years old, my parents had been praying for me that I would accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Being raised in a Christian home, it was... I really thought that I was a Christian. And then night by night, I was having trouble going to sleep. And I remember my parents, they would counsel me every night and tell me, this is the way you are saved and everything. And it never really hit home until one night when I was in revival and I realized that I was lost and on my way to hell. At your church? Right, at my church. Now, how did you come to Liberty? Who, who told you about this school? Okay, uh, my junior year in high school, yeah, my junior year in high school, the LBC singers came to my hometown and I went and saw them. And I saw in them a God that was not just someone you go to church on Sunday to, to meet with, that it was a, a God that was a part of their everyday lives. And I really desired to be in a school like that. And you came here. And I came here. God bless you, Rhonda. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Rozier is a junior from Waterloo, Illinois, and I believe a pastoral major. Yes, sir. How did you become a Christian, Steve? I became a Christian at the age of 10 at a Billy Graham crusade. Where? Um, in St. Louis, Illinois. And you were 10 years old? 10 years old. How did you hear about Liberty Baptist College? Liberty Baptist College I never heard about until three months before I graduated from high school. And a faith partner, Ruth Lowenstein, sent me out here to see the school. I know Ruth Lowenstein. She's yeah. a real supporter of this work. Well, she underwrote me for the first two years here, paid my school bill completely and sent me here to Liberty Baptist College. And those 15,000 club members have kept you here since then. What do you hope to do one day when you finally graduate? Well, I plan to go out and start a church, probably most likely in Los Angeles. At least that's what I've been praying about, and that's where I'm heading to right now. God bless you, Steve. Thank, Thank you. you. Yvonne Monahan is a senior from Hyannis, Nebraska, majoring Believe it or not, in... Business administration. Business administration. Now, what do you hope to do when, when you leave here? Well, my plans are not real definite right now, but I have plans of either going back to Lincoln, Nebraska, or Denver, Colorado, and getting a job. 
Well, tell us this, uh, Yvonne, you've been a Christian how long? I was saved last year at the beginning of the school year. When I was nine years old, I'd made a profession of faith, but I had had a lot of trouble with doubts. And last year at the beginning of the year in an evening service, Dean Dobson was preaching, and I realized that I had never really been saved, and then I was saved at that time. And then the Lord, since then, has done a work in your life? Yes. And you're going to leave here? Will you graduate this year? Yes. God bless you. You know, little, big things come in little packages. Thank you. Okay. Now, let's see if I can... Um, this is Diane Anderson from where in Maryland? Ellerslie. Ellerslie, Maryland. And you're a junior and majoring in what? Biology. And minoring in? Chemistry. You're a glutton for punishment, aren't you? <laughs> what do you hope to do someday, Diane? When I graduate, I want to go to medical school and become the best doctor that, the, that I can be with the Lord's help. Tell them who, among others, you serve as the teacher in lab for. Jeannie Falwell. <laughs> that little daughter of mine, who's, uh, this is her teacher in lab. But uh, real quickly, uh, Diane, how did you become a Christian? When I was five years old, my mother um, was talking to me one night, and I realized that I needed the Lord as my Savior. And through her witness, I became a Christian. Christian parents are a wonderful heritage, as are Christian children. And when you leave here, it is your hope, again, to, to teach, doctor. to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. You're going to be a doctor. Yes. All right, Dr. Anderson, <laughs> God bless you. Thank We're you. with you. All right. <laughs> Rocky Riosico was born in Cuba. And at the age of nine, yes. joined over a hundred others in two little tiny fishing boats escaping Castro's tyranny, Amen. came to the United States. Tell us your own story. How did you become a Christian, Rocky? At the age of 18, I went to a youth group, gave a karate demonstration at the time, and I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus loved me, had died for me, forgiven me of all my sins. And that was the greatest news I've ever heard and just clung onto it with all my heart. And Rocky, you are a second year student. Yes, sir. Studying what? Pastorate with a theology minor. You going to be a preacher? Yes, sir. Do you have an idea where yet? Uh, it thrills me to know that we are able to speak here and be seen all over the world, Dr. Falwell, through the means of television. And I, I pray to God that he will use me to that effect. God bless you, Rocky. Thank you. Rocky Riosico. <laughs> now I want all you kids to come right back around me here because... I want that everybody watching by television right now might see at least one face that attracts you. <laughs> and surely out of this group, there might be one. One reason, maybe several reasons why you should join our scholarship club and help us right now by calling that toll-free number, joining the 15,000 club, making a $200 commitment but you may pay any way you wish, $20 a month, the next 10 months, however you wish. These young people really are typical of what our burden is, what this student body is all about. They're one reason why this is the fastest growing school in the country, one reason why our young people are making a difference. I meet them everywhere. When I go to Washington, I meet them in the offices of senators and congressmen working in staff positions. When I go out in press conferences, I meet them out there with microphones and television cameras and journalism pads already in the media. When I go out in the business world, I find them already, as I did at Princeton the other night uh, speaking. I found one of our students working in the controller's office there before I spoke to the students at Princeton. I meet our graduates everywhere, and I'm telling you, the hope for changing America is the miracle of training young men and young women who will go out literally infiltrate society with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the message of a living Savior, and the principles that are taught in the Word of God. I'm convinced of that. Yes, sir, go ahead and give that a hand. This man's turned on here. I'm sincere about this. One day we're going to have 50,000 students on this mountain. Now, you kids here who were not here back in the days when we, had, uh, we met at Thomas Road Church, this was just 1971, 
and the little houses across Thomas Road were our dormitories. And uh, then later we moved to Ruffner School, condemned at that time by the city. They wouldn't use it for the public school purposes. We used it. And then we got Brookville High School building before they tore it down. That's where I graduated in 1950. We used it. We used the Ramada Inn. We've used everything, young people, in order to keep the school growing. We've grown from 100 students in 71 uh, to several thousands of students today. And the miracle continues. And we are going to have one day, we just started building on this campus six years ago with nearly 40 buildings here now. One day we're going to have schools of law and medicine and engineering and journalism. And we're going to have 50,000 students, of course, many other majors, training preachers, pastors, missionaries, evangelists, our forte. But if we're going to turn the nation around, we've got to train the young champions to do it. We keep saying champions for Christ. And I want to ask my friends at home right now who believe that training young people is important, young people like these kids, I want you to go to your telephone right now, pick up that phone and dial the toll-free number. We pay for it. We pay for the call. 1-800-446-5000. Pledge $200. We will immediately send you four books that we call the 1983 Christian Family Library. This happens to be the four books, 7,118 pages. Book one is the Bible Almanac. I'm not going to take the time as I often do to go through it and show you what's inside it, except to say 732 pages, 500 pages of illustrations, a tour guide through the Word of God. And Rocky, I think I'll give that one to you. Where's Rocky? Okay, you're in on that one. Two of the books are the Old Testament in super giant print type, 24 point type, block letters, Genesis through 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles through Malachi, for Jerry Falwell and a lot of other people who have problem reading small print, it has been a godsend. And if you don't need it, it can be a privilege, it can be a blessing, perhaps to someone at the nursing home for Christmas time, a gift to somebody you love. But uh, Caleb, I'm going to give you Genesis through 2 Kings. By next year, you can buy the other one. And uh, Diane, give you 1 Chronicles through Malachi. And book number four is the Liberty Bible Commentary, 2,721 pages. Dr. Ed Heinsohn and about 20 Bible professors at Liberty have taken the entire King James Version and put it in the left column of every page and their comments on what the verses mean in the right column. I think it's the most valuable book in print. If you could only have one book the rest of your life, kids, this would be it. And uh, I think I'll give that one to our little business major who's going to go out and take over Wall Street. Those four books will ship to everyone who calls the dial, uh, dials the, the toll free number right now and three to five days from now by UPS delivered at your door simply because you helped us educate young champions for Christ and you committed $200 to this enterprise. I hope you'll do it right now. This is the 15,000 club certificate. It hanging on your wall simply says that you're helping train a student at Liberty. And I sincerely hope that our phones will light up right now and that the deficit we're now experiencing will soon be history because enough of you cared for enough of these young people to invest $200 in their Christian education. Every professor here, and they're seated in this chapel right now as they are three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. These professors are all born again believers, believe in the inerrancy of scripture, Love the Lord, not one exception. Every one of these students is here because as the kids you've heard from today, they love the Lord and they've come here to be trained to be champions for Christ. And your help, your commitment will make the difference. I hope that every one of you right now will call the toll-free number, make your pledge, join the team, and become a part of the scholarship club training young champions for Christ. Thank you, young people. We appreciate so very much your testimony is here today. If you happen to live in Hawaii, Alaska, Canada, that toll-free number will not work. In order to join the 15,000 Club, you need to write me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, 24514 in Canada. Many friends there and many Canadian students here. Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario.
just before my message today on You Can Change the World. Don Norman comes to sing. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, he said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. There's life in Jesus' name. There's cleansing and there's healing in Jesus' name. Believe him. Come unto Him, receive from Him power for in Jesus' name. There's life for you this hour. Sin abounds on every hand, bringing death to every man. There's no life, there's no hope. So it seems, but Jesus came to give us life. He brings all hope, removes all sin and strife. So just believe and have life in Jesus' name. Oh, there's life. There's cleansing, and yes, there's healing in Jesus' name. Believe Him, come unto Him, receive from Him power for in Jesus' name. There's life for you this hour. He turned the water into wine, touched the blind and gave them sight. He opened deaf ears and gave strength to the lame. So many wonders he performed so that you and I and everyone might believe. Young people, you can change the world. There's no question about it. As a matter of fact, young people, I think you have a God-given obligation to change the world. You only pass through life once. There are no reruns. You are not here by chance or coincidence. I believe in the sovereignty of God in the affairs of men and women. You are here by divine ordination. God brought you here, and while you are here, you need from Almighty God to learn the principles that can cause you to make an impact upon your society. There have been for 6,000 years of human history two rivers of freedom flowing down through 
generations of men. One, a river of political liberty. The other, a river of religious liberty. But in those approximately 6,000 years, never have the two rivers converged and produced a society in the which both religious and political freedom existed and flourished until a couple of centuries ago, the United States of America became a reality in our world. There are other societies, of course, in history that have had seasons of freedom. But we have had now two centuries of unparalleled freedom. To whom much is given, much shall be required. God Almighty has brought about, in my opinion, this free society for the purpose of honoring Him through the sharing of the gospel of Christ with the entire world out of this environment of freedom. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All truth originates in a person whose name is Jesus Christ. Now let's open our Bibles to the first page. The first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now in the same book, Genesis 12, the same verses, 1, 2, and 3, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Let us pray. Our Father... We want to change the world. We want to see peace on this earth. We want to see that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the only true and living Savior, shall be presented to all men in our generation. May these young people, these young champions in the making before me today, be a part of that miracle. For Christ's sake, amen. Our founding fathers built formed, put together a nation under God. All the founding fathers were not godly men, but they were most certainly impressed by the godly influence of the Jonathan Edwards, the Pilgrims, the Puritans, the Wesleys, the Whitfields, those great champions of the Word of God who, under the leadership of God's Spirit, brought to this nation a renaissance of freedom, a desire for building a nation under God. And as a result, when you read the diary of Columbus who said he came here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to Scripture, saying that nearly 500 years ago, when you meet, read the Mayflower Compact, 360 years old, and realize they came here for the purpose of the propagating of the Christian religion, when you read the first charter of Virginia and the New England Confederation of over 300 years ago and listen to them say that they came here for the purpose of bringing the light of the gospel and religious freedom to a new world, there can be no question this is and has been from its inception a nation under God. When you read the Constitution, when you read the Declaration of Independence, you read of that Creator, capital C, who determined that all men should be equal and should, in an environment of freedom, have the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Freedom was born in the heart of God. You can mark this down. God Almighty has nothing to do with Marxism or any other system of the bondage of minds and men and bodies. God hates the slavery and the bondage 
of all of the empires of the past that are now history and extinct, that have blotted out and refused to give to men liberty and freedom and the privileges of self-expression. America is that miracle of freedom that you, every one of you, are charged to rebuild. And somehow, no matter how dark the age in the which we live, one day deliver to your children a greater and freer society than we have given to you. Now, why do we need champions for Christ? We have a liberal arts institution here. It will soon be a university. We are fully accredited. Why are we training scientists? You heard a young person here say, I'm majoring in biology, minoring in chemistry. Why do we have a business major in this institution? Why are we, for example, training scientists and educators? Why do we have a political science emphasis here? Why are we trying to educate young people on politics? What about journalism? Why do we want journalists coming out of this school? Or television and radio major? Why, why would we want young people in television, in radio, in the print media? Why do we have pre-law and heading towards a law school? My daughter is taking pre-med here and she's going to be going to medical school as are many others here. Why do we have these various majors? And of course, why are we training pastors and missionaries and evangelists, preachers? Why are we doing that? And many other majors, over 50 majors. Because it is my conviction that if we can, number one, train you to be a leader in whatever God calls you to, number two, teach you the principles of successful life successful families, a successful society, if we can teach you the biblical principles on how to win in life and how to contribute to the world, and furthermore then, if we can send you out into every sector of society as born-again, Christian, dedicated subversives, subversives like the communists who have subverted our society and infiltrated our society and corrupted it, and the secular humanists who have done the same thing, if we can now reverse that trend on them and put you in key places in every part of today's society, we can make a difference. It is one thing to curse the darkness. It's another thing to light a few candles. And you are the candles, and I pray one day Dave, by the grace of God, we'll have some champions here in the fields of science and politics and education. I think Washington can be turned around. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be raising all the noise I'm raising. I wouldn't be out fighting and feuding and fussing with the politicians if I didn't believe we could change it. I wouldn't be challenging you kids to take political science. I believe one day we're going to have some United States senators out of this group right here. And I'll be coming in your office and asking for an appointment. I believe someday we're going to have some congressmen, some U.S. representatives right out of this group right here. Some governors. Why not? Some U.S. ambassadors to the rest of the world. Why not maybe a president or two? I mentioned a while ago, speaking at Princeton the other night, we had the place packed and we turned away enough people to fill Alexander Hall again. An enthusiastic crowd. They weren't all in agreement, but by the time we ended, they were up in the seats yelling, shouting, applauding. We had a tremendous time, great time. And they've graduated at least two presidents, James Madison and Woodrow Wilson, both Virginians. They didn't have any from their area. We had to produce them for them, but they, <laughs> but they graduated two presidents. And why couldn't we do the same thing right here? We talk about a fundamentalist Harvard. We talk about a a university here, a spiritual institution that can change America and influence the world for Christ, and I believe it. I am not interested in just improving education for education's sake, or science for science's sake, or medicine for medicine's sake. I am interested in doing all of that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want you to go out and make a mark on society as a great person but rather as a great Christian who represents your Lord well and to whom others can look and see, that is what I need. 
Many students are here right now because some of our musical groups came by or missions groups or Smite or whatever to your church or to your town and you looked up on that platform and you saw in their faces and heard in their words something you didn't have and decided, I'd like to go and get what they got where they got it. And here you are at Liberty. And thank, I met a couple of parents out on the sidewalk as I came into chapel today. They said, well, you remember a year ago, you were in Potsdam, Pennsylvania? A year ago today, they said. And I had my son there. And I wasn't all sure he'd come to Liberty. And Don Norman prayed for him. And he was there and so forth. He's down here now and he loves it. And they're just down spending the week bugging him. Thank the Lord for changed lives. And you can make a difference. Now, there are five great controversies raging today. And the text I just read from Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 12, there are five great controversies raging in our society today that only champions can confront and conquer. Controversy 1, Genesis 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God. The eternality and sovereignty of God is being challenged today everywhere. Do you know why there's no prayer in public schools? Do you know why there's America, an American Civil Liberties Union jerking manger scenes out of city halls? Do you know why there's a challenge to even having chaplains for the Senate and the House of Representatives? Do you know why when you get invited to speak to a lot of places they tell you, they don't mention the name of Jesus because there is a controversy raging today over the eternality and sovereignty of Almighty God as it opposes secular humanism. Someone must win that battle. In every sector of society, there's no difference between the secular and the sacred. They're all the same for a Christian. I was asked at a university some weeks ago, as I, and I'm speaking about two universities a week, I was asked, now please keep your speech political. Don't mention the name of Jesus. I didn't comment, didn't say I would, didn't say I wouldn't. <laughs> and my first statement was, as I stood before the students, we had the auditorium packed, I was asked by my host and your representative not to mention the name of Jesus Christ or my faith, so he has discharged his responsibility. He's off the hook. But let me tell you how I became a Christian 31 years ago. I said, if I can tell you when I can't talk about Jesus, you need another speaker. And the place broke out in applause. The only people ashamed of Jesus are these folk in officialdom who are afraid of offending somebody somewhere because of our wonderful God. Don't you ever be ashamed of him. If he's not welcome, you walk out. I went on. I went on to tell them, that I used to be just like you. I was 18 years old, a college sophomore, didn't own a Bible. My father was never in church in his life. His dad before him, an atheist. I was just as spiritually ignorant as some of you are. But I got all that change one day when I heard the, the gospel, the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through an old-time preacher, Charles E. Fuller, the old-fashioned revival hour. And I realized I was a sinner on my road to hell, and Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, paid the price for once, forever, and I bowed my head and heart and said, Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and God saved me, and I've been saved ever since, and nothing's been the same since. Now I said, I've got that off my heart. Let me talk to you about why I came here. Don't you ever be ashamed of the Lord. We are in a battle regarding the eternality and the sovereignty of God, and only champions can win that battle. Every one of you scientists, I see Jim Hall and Lane Lester and all you guys, every one of you, you've been fighting this battle ever since you became a Christian. And the argument always is, how can you be a Christian and a scientist? I don't know how you could be a good scientist if you're not a Christian. I'm not going to say that there are not great scientists who are not Christians, but I'm saying you'll be a better scientist once you understand the spiritual perspective. I believe that with all my heart. And, and somebody always questions, well, how can one teach biology and also believe in the Bible? And I just happen to think you're a better biology teacher when you know the Bible. I really believe that. And, and so that's one struggle, one great challenge faced. The second, in the beginning, God created. The second great controversy is the creative work of God. 
Have you ever heard such a stir? I, in, in the question and answer period in every university forum, press conference, you name it, everywhere, almost everywhere, someone will invariably ask, how could you possibly believe in the Genesis account of creation? I said, well, you know, I, I'm like that uh, agnostic astronomer in Great Britain the other day. He doesn't believe in God. But he said mathematically and scientifically, evolution won't fly anymore for me. He said, now, I'm not going to say there's a God somewhere or a designer, but I've got to explore another avenue. Evolution is dead. It just doesn't match up scientifically and mathematically. So I said, I, I guess I'm like thousands of scientists today who believe in the beginning God created. And with that creation, that wonderful creation, God brought man complete, entire, body, soul, spirit in the image of God into the world to have dominion over the world. And young people, you need to understand this is God's creation, God's universe. All of history is God's story, His story. And you can infiltrate society and win this conflict. We can, in fact, wherever we are, bring the glory to God if we're willing as champions, properly trained, to go out and do combat. Number three, in those first verses of the Bible, he said, let there be light, and there was light. The controversy is where light comes from. We believe God is the source of all light, not just the light that emanates from the sun by which we live and walk and breathe and eat, but the light that comes from truth. Jesus is the truth. You shall know the truth, the light, and the truth shall make you free. All educational light comes from Him. In Him is all truth. All truth is embodied in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in the professor, not in man. You are not the God. It is not your mind that is the ultimate source of truth. That is where the secular humanist and Bible-believing Christians part ways. Man in the secular humanistic philosophy believes that he is the measure of all things and that man can eventually develop his own utopia on this earth. Here we are 6,000 years down in human history in far worse shape than we were then, years ago. The fact is that man can't do it and God is the source of all light. Number four, the controversy centers around the people of God, Israel, and today his church. God told Abram, I will bless them who bless you. I'll make of you a great nation. Have you ever picked up your paper recently without a front page story on the Middle East, Israel, Lebanon, the Marines? That was true last year and the year before and the year before. And it's going to be true from henceforth because the Jew is still the apple of God's eye. I finished my address at an Ivy League school the other day and the other night rather, and as I was walking out, a student caught me at the door and put his hand on my shoulder and said, uh, Doctor, I'm Jewish and I love you and hang in there. And that is exactly the way it is. God's chosen people, the Jewish nation. Young people, there's more anti-Semitism in the world today than I've ever known. And I want to challenge you to go out and stamp out racism and stamp out anti-Semitism and stamp out all of these things that have kept us from getting the gospel to the world and honoring God and believing the Abrahamic covenant that God blesses nations in proportion to how those nations bless or curse Israel. Let's keep America on the side of the covenant of Abraham. Let's keep America on the side of the Jew so that God can continue to bless America. Now that's the controversy we are facing out there. There's no question about it. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ grafted in. We were outsiders, aliens, aliens, but by the grace of God, we have been grafted into the family and we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. One day we believe that the eyes of the Jewish nation shall be opened. The Scripture says a nation shall be saved in a day. And yes, I believe that's going to ha happen yet. I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but I believe God keeps His Word. And I believe until then we have an obligation to commit ourselves to the Jew. And furthermore, I believe that all the prophecies regarding the sanctity and the preciousness of the Jewish people as well apply to the church. For example, touch not mine anointed. Do my prophets no harm. The Soviet Union today is persecuting Christians and Jews. 
the Soviet Union today that hates God, I'm not speaking of the Russian people. The Russian people, like any other people in the world, are victims of their own godless, tyrannical government. But the Soviet government today hates God, hates Christ, hates religion, hates faith, and obviously, therefore, they hate the Jew and they hate the church. And just like Adolf Hitler, the last of the Philistines a generation ago, was wiped out because they touched the apple of God's eye, you can be sure of this, that the Soviets, because they're now beginning to persecute and touch the Jew and the church, the apple of God's eye, are going to find that it's not America who is to be feared, it's the Almighty God. And then there's a fifth controversy. God told Abram, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's the promise of Messiah. There's a controversy in the world today over God's Son and our Messiah. I'm asked constantly, never, never do I speak anywhere. In the Q&A period that follows, someone doesn't come and say, do you believe that a Buddhist or a Muslim or this or that, do you believe that all people who reject Jesus Christ are lost? And the pressure is on there to compromise and say, hey, as long as you're sincere, all roads lead to heaven. We're all working for the same place. Don't you ever be guilty of that kind of compromise. Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He said, I'm the way. You didn't write that, so you don't have to apologize for it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I tell them, I said, hey, if I were to do the simple and the compromising thing, the easy thing, I would tell you, yes, I believe we're all working for the same place, and I would say there's no exclusivity in this thing called salvation in Christ, and I'd get off the hook today. But a lot of you in this building know that's not what I preach at Thomas Road Baptist Church, and that's not what I preach on the old-time gospel hour, and you'd lose confidence in me. You'd lose respect for me, and properly so. The fact is, I'll tell you here like I tell the people at Thomas Road, Jesus said, if any man attempts to come up any other way other than by me, he's a thief and a robber. I am the way, the truth, the life. There's no way to the Father but by him. And that is why I'm here tonight to tell you that God loves you and Christ died for you as an individual. It has nothing to do with black and white and Jewish and Muslim and Buddhist. It has to do with a universe for whom Jesus died 2,000 years ago. And young people, when you get out there in the world where you're the only one maybe in the crowd that believes that, don't you dare dilute or water down that message. And there's always that pressure. And kids, you're going to be there one day to compromise or somehow soften your position. Don't do it. You know, you, you didn't need to come to liberty to learn that. You could have gotten that anywhere. You came to liberty, hopefully, because you want to be a champion for Christ in whatever work God has called you to do. And those people that I looked at just a little while ago in that camera and asked them to call me and pledge $200 and join the 15,000 Club and help me educate you haven't given that money here because they want you to be a softy or a pussyfooter or a compromiser. They want you to be a champion. And you have an obligation not only to God and this institution and the faculty and administration, but to every person who's ever made a contribution to help educate you. There are billions of dollars in endowment funds in colleges and universities across America given by God-fearing American citizens of decades ago, now dead and gone. When those schools were true to the Word of God, those schools now have gone liberal, even socialist and Marxist in some areas, and God's money is supporting something opposite to the philosophy of the people who gave the money. I'd rather see this school burn to the ground than we would ever betray one donor, one friend of this ministry, and especially our Lord. And I hope that every one of you will go out of here determined under God. I'm not going to be just a flunky, follow the gang, check the wind and go that way. I know what I believe and why I believe it and lovingly and graciously and firmly I'm going to take my stand on the Word of God. Now, if you'll do that in journalism, in the classroom, in the science lab, in the halls of Congress, in the pulpits, before television cameras, 
If you'll do that in whatever God's called you to be as a professional person, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever, if you go out of here determined, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to stand true to the Word of God. I'm not going to allow Satan one moment to force me to compromise. Your children one day will rise up and call you blessed. And more important than that, one day you'll hear our Lord say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And it just may be that we'll weather the storm of the 80s and maybe the 90s if our Lord hasn't returned. And it just may be that the threats of the Soviets and the goals of the Marxists will not be accomplished. And it just may be that for the first time since the first generation after Christ, the gospel of Christ may appear to all men. We may give the gospel of Jesus to every person in our generation. May God make it so. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I want Dr. Ed Heinsohn, my associate, family counseling director, to come and lead us in a prayer. And right now, listen, young people, I want you to make a fresh dedication of your heart, your life, your talent to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Dr. Heinsohn, please lead us in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for the challenging and stirring message that we've heard this morning. God, we recognize that ultimately you are our champion, our King, our Lord, the God who through the power of the Holy Spirit makes champions, the God who raised up Moses to lead the children of Israel, the God who raised up Joshua to bring down the walls of Jericho, the God who raised up David to be King of Israel. God who raised up prophets like Elijah and John the Baptist to confront sin in their generation. And God incarnate in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God, we pray that in our lives, in our hearts, and in this student body, you would work in the life of every single young man and young lady to make them a champion for you in the area of service to which you send them. And Father, I pray that the prayer of our heart might be, Oh, God, use us to reach our generation for the cause of Jesus Christ. And beyond the generation of even this faculty, I pray that these students might then train another generation and in turn another for the cause of Christ that the gospel might go forth across this nation and ultimately around this world that millions might come to know you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We've left the multipurpose center and the service there. I brought you here to the prayer chapel. I wanted to bring you to a quiet place where I can share with you one more time the burden that's on my heart. I need to underwrite every student you saw in that multipurpose center, thousands of them. Some who are studying business. They'll be going out supporting the free market, the free enterprise system, some in politics, some in the ministry of the gospel, of every one of them representing Jesus Christ to a world that needs to know him. I want you to go to the telephone right now. I've never needed your help more. Not for Jerry Falwell, but for those young people. They're precious to me. I hope they said something to you today. I hope their testimonials said something to you. We could have taken the rest of the week, one after the other, sharing their testimony. But I think you heard enough. Now, please go to the telephone. We pay for the call. Dial the toll-free number, 1-800-446-5000. Join the 15,000 Club. Pledge $200. You may pay it $20 a month for the next 10 months, any way you wish. But do it now because the students are here. We cannot, we just cannot increase tuition every semester and make it impossible for them to stay here. And because you went to the telephone right now, because you care about these kids, because you believe they can change America, and give the gospel to the world, and I believe it with all my heart, to show our appreciation for your investment of $200 in one of our students, we'll send you, first of all, the 15,000 club certificate, which framed hanging on your wall, it says to everyone who comes by with my name signed to it, your name on it, you are helping train a young champion for Christ. We'll ship you today four books, over 7,000 pages in them. This is the Bible Almanac. 
732 pages, 500 pictures, illustrations, drawings, photographs. This will become your tour guide through the Bible 2,000 years ago. Bible lands, Bible places, Bible people, archaeological finds, etc. It will make the Bible come alive for you. You'll, you'll, this will be your tour guide through the Word of God. And not only a tour guide through the Word of God, but a real stimulant to study the Word more. Books two and three, the super giant print type Bible, 24 point type. This is the Old Testament, Genesis through 2 Kings, volume one, 1 Chronicles through Malachi, volume two. And to give you an idea of the size of the print, actually block letters here from Deuteronomy chapter 11, you can see the size of the print. It, uh, no matter what your eye problem, the chances are like Jerry Falwell, you can read it. And book four, the finest book in print, the Liberty Bible Commentary, 2,721 2, pages. The 20 Bible professors here at Liberty have taken the entire King James version of the Bible, and they have put it in the left column, Genesis or Revelation, the left column of every page right here. Across in the right column, these Bible professors have explained the meaning of those verses. It's like having a set of 20 scholars, Bible scholars, sitting there in the living room with you every time you open the Bible to help you understand it and read it. Now, those four books will be at your door the next three to five days, delivered by UPS. If you call the toll-free number right now, then you can pay the $200 scholarship gift any way you want. Please call right now. Forget what I'm giving you. Forget what we're giving to you. And I think it's very, very worthwhile. Think of the young people in whose faces you look today. And this is the fastest growing such college in the world today, as far as I know. Think of those kids who one day are going to turn this nation around and give the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Will you help me educate them? Dial me 1-800-446-5000. We pay for the call. And dear friends, Talk to your friends about helping us. I've never been more desperate about underwriting the young people because we are behind, we need help. And yet I've never been for, more convinced that God is going to give us the help we need as I am right now because I've taken you to chapel with me. I've let you see what I see three times a week in chapel. The young people, those are most precious commodities. I'm looking for your call. If you live in Hawaii, Alaska, Canada, that number won't work. Write me, Jerry Falwell, Lynchburg, Virginia, or in Canada, Box 505, Richmond Hill, Ontario. These young people can change America. They can turn the world upside down. Help me train them. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Liberty Broadcasting System.